Here we are in late fall, which can be a funny time of year for gardening. Too late to grow many of our favorites? Yet, it's still too early to pack it all up and start planning for next year. Some crops are in fact just hitting their stride, and the cooler weather brings on an unreal sweetness, like no other time of year. But, regardless of your fall plantings, summer's heavy hitters have become next year's topsoil, and compost bins are filled to the brim with more plant material than at any other time of the year. It may not look like it on this particular day, but on average, it's cold and it's wet, and it's often not very much fun to be out in the garden. So, here's Volume 18, Episodes 171 to 180 to watch instead. Enjoy. Not that long ago, we harvested these beautiful bulbs after nine plus months in the ground. And wouldn't you know it, it's almost time to get the next batch planted. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're garlic obsessed. And today's episode is what allows that obsession to flourish because it's all about when to plant your garlic. We'll cover it all, but time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Right off the bat, we have to realize that there are two types of garlic, hardneck and softneck. Now, your hardnecks are typically grown in the cooler climates, while the softneck are grown in warmer ones. So, let's start with the softneck first. As a general rule, Garlic of all kinds is planted in the fall, about a month before the real cold weather hits. This is because the individual cloves need to undergo a cooling process known as vernalization to start stimulating the bulbing process. Soft neck garlic, however, are unique in that they don't need this chilling process. Thus, they're more suited to grow in a warmer climate. As such, they have a much larger planting window and they can be put in the ground anywhere from early fall to early spring. However, for best results with softnecks in zones 8 or higher in the northern hemisphere, you're going to want to be planting them between October and December when those soil temperatures hit about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you live in an area that gets hard freezing and or snow, well, you're likely going to be growing the hardneck types of garlic. And these ones are much more straightforward because they're as unforgiving as the climate in which they're grown. Truly, planting your hard neck garlic is simple. It's a short window. Three to four weeks before your first fall frost date is when you need to get them into the ground. Too soon, and those cloves will put on too much above ground foliage that's just going to get destroyed in the winter. Too late though, and that impending cold is going to hit before those cloves have a chance to send out roots and get themselves established. So, for zones 9 or lower, don't be messing around. A month before your first fall frost date is when you need to get your garlic cloves into the ground. And speaking of not messing around, make sure to subscribe and check out the next episode of The Garden Quickie. You know, here on this channel, more than any other question, I get asked, when and how much are you supposed to water your garlic? It's a question with multiple right answers, creating confusion with no such thing as a universal watering schedule. In fact, I don't even water my garlic once from the time it's planted in October until maybe March or April of the following year. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we get wet so you don't have to. And today's episode is all about watering your garlic. More specifically, how to determine when your garlic needs water throughout the different stages of its life cycle. Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. When garlic gets planted as individual dry cloves, either in the fall in the case of hardneck 
or in the spring in the case of soft neck, it's the surrounding moisture in the soil that activates those roots to start sprouting. And it happens pretty much immediately within a few days tops. To truly get the biggest and best bulbs, that moisture needs to be present throughout the garlic's entire life cycle, which can sometimes be upwards of nine plus months. The amount and frequency of your garlic watering is therefore dictated by two things, your soil type and your climate. Let's look at both. Soils live on a spectrum, from sandy ones that can't hold on to any moisture at all, to the clay ones that can't get rid of the excess. Your garlic, like most plants, likes it somewhere in between. A good garlic soil is going to drain freely, but it's also going to hold on to some moisture, negating the need to water daily. Which leads us to trying to define the right amount of water for your garlic, which I'm always hesitant to do. Generally, if you're planting your garlic in the fall and you get a wet or snowy winter, you likely don't have to water until spring. If, however, you're planting in a warm climate or your winters are particularly dry, well, then you need to water immediately after planting to stimulate those roots to start growing. If you're the type of person that needs hard numbers, however, these are the general guidelines that I suggest. Keeping in mind, there's no such thing as a universal watering schedule. As a rule, sandy soils get two inches of water per week, barring any precipitation. Clay ones, much less at that, at half to one inch. Now, the amount and type of organic matter within your soil is also gonna have an effect on moisture retention. So, these rules are almost impossible to set in stone, as there's a million different permutations to consider when you're dealing with soil type as well as climate. In the end, be diligent, but thoughtful. Keep an eye on that moisture, and use a moisture meter if you have to. Remember, garlic is typically grown right at the surface. So if you're ever curious about where the moisture level is at in your soil, it's not too difficult to check. Just like it's not too difficult to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. For pretty much 90% of the crops that we grow in our garden, as in life, there's a beginning and there's an end. Annuals are the name of the game and even heavy hitters like peppers and these tomatoes here don't last forever. All good things must eventually come to an end. But in gardening, it's never truly the end as every part of the plant can serve a purpose. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show we're in two minutes or less we always serve a purpose. And today's episode is all about chop and drop. More specifically, a quick breakdown of what it is, how you can do it at home, and why it's such a great gardening practice. Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. With good soil, lots of sunlight, and the right amount of water, our crops can truly reach epic proportions. After harvesting all that bounty though, many growers simply yank out the spent plants at the end of the season. Honestly, this is one of the worst things that you can do for your garden, as well as your soil. Plus, it's a lot of unnecessary work. Chop and Drop solves this, and cleaning up your garden at the end of the season has never been easier. As the name implies, Chop and Drop is simply just that, and it tries to mimic what nature does every fall. Leaves, stems, branches, and even logs. Plant material constantly falls to the ground, becoming food for the soil, as well as its next top layer. On top of that, it also protects the current top layer from exposure and extreme elements as the ultimate mulch. So why not do it at home? It's easy, let me show you how. First, you may have to cut away some of that foliage so that you can see the base of the plant. In this case, a red brushing kale. Once you do, cut the plant down right at the root color 
and simply lay it down in place. Honestly, that's it. That's all you have to do. Now, in the case of big plants like corn, I do cut up the stalks into smaller pieces, but it's not necessary. Remember, even though this is really good for the garden, we're also here to minimize the work. What may look like a daunting task, I'll take out this tomato bed in mere minutes. And the bonus of it all is we're adding back the specific nutrient profile that the plants originally took out in the first place. How cool is that? Almost as cool as checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Ginger, the amazing aromatic rhizome that elevates any dish. The fresh stuff is out of this world. No wonder so many people want to grow it at home. But for how fast it sprouts and gets going, Ginger is a surprisingly long crop, a long tropical growing cycle that can rival even garlic and test your patience at the same time. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, patience is our middle name. And today's episode is all about that ginger. More specifically, when can we finally harvest the rhizomes? It can take a while, but time today is short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Although not even slightly related, and even with one being a root tuber and the other one being a modified stem, harvesting ginger mimics that of the humble potato. And that's because like these guys, there are two times during the ginger's life cycle when you can harvest it. And the first of those is what's known as baby ginger. Smooth, fresh, and often tinted pink or even red, baby ginger begins to appear about four months after planting. Make sure to pick this stuff fresh only as you need it, because unfortunately, baby ginger does not store very well, even in the fridge. As awesome as the young plant is, the bulk of ginger is harvested as a mature rhizome, and that can take anywhere from eight to 10 months after planting. The key indicator letting you know that your ginger is mature and ready for harvest is the dying foliage. Those tall, lush, dark green stems and leaves turn yellow and brown just as the rhizomes are maturing. Once you see that, you know that the ginger is ready to pick. Now, the mature stuff is going to have a tough, armor-like skin that needs to be peeled before eating. But for long-term storage, simply wipe away the loose dirt and leave the rhizomes intact. Amazingly, they'll store long enough to start the next generation of ginger crops. And long enough for you to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. The bounty has been long picked, the foliage beginning to look a little crispy. And not just because it's turned brown. Winter cold is starting to bite, but we're not quite ready to buy in just yet. It's no secret that strawberry plants grow better in cooler climates with defined seasons. Exploding with all those delicious berries in the summer, but completely dormant and peaceful in the winter. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show we're in two minutes or less. We're neither dormant nor peaceful. And today's episode is all about those strawberries. More specifically, when is the right time to prepare them for winter? Patience is the key, but for us here today, the time is short as you know it is, so let's dive in. You'll find that pretty much all strawberry varieties love the cold. In fact, they require a certain amount of cumulative days of low temperatures, known as chilling hours, to successfully fruit the following season. However, even strawberries have their limits and prolonged exposure below 15 degrees Fahrenheit can damage the naked crowns. So those of us growing in cooler climates must winterize our strawberries. We do this by pruning the old foliage, removing all those runners, 
weeding them clean, and insulating them with a nice thick layer of mulch. The key to properly winterizing your strawberries, however, is to make sure that you don't do it too early. Too soon and warming up your strawberry plants, tricking them into thinking it's spring, they're gonna go and burst their buds. When winter does truly hit just a short time later, it's gonna be fatal for those plants, even if they're protected. So the timing is very important, but fortunately, nature does most of the work for us. In those warmer climates that barely get below freezing, or regions that get a fairly large snowpack, leaving the dead foliage in place is likely all you need to do. Once you get colder to say zone 7 or even lower, the best time to winterize your strawberry plants is when they've had a minimum of three consecutive nights of a hard frost. More is better, as it's only when the plants have truly entered dormancy that you should be adding that mulch layer for winter protection. In some regions, that may be as early as October. Others, like mine, it may be not until mid-December. Remember, with strawberries, it's best to winterize them slightly late than it is to do it too early. Let the plants tell you when it's time, while also keeping an eye on your local weather. Oh, and make sure to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Despite being one of the first crops harvested in the spring, we're now on the doorstep of winter and it's still carrot pulling season. An unbeatable root crop with few issues for the home grower. There is one problem though that creeps up from time to time that can be a nuisance. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, no problem is too small. And today's episode is all about those carrots. More specifically, the hairy ones. What causes it? Why does it happen? And how can you prevent it? Time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Take a poll of any carrot grower and you'll find out that hairy carrots are more common than you think. And that's because there's three reasons why they occur. The first of those is the most common, and that's fertilizer. And by fertilizer, I mean too much of it, particularly nitrogen. Almost without fail, excess and persistent nitrogen in your soil is going to cause an explosion of feeder roots off of the main carrot. So, if you're starting to see this all of a sudden, chances are you need to dial back the nutrients. The second cause of hairy roots in your carrots is moisture, this time a lack of it. The main root on a carrot plant is the carrot itself. In times of excessively dry conditions, that taproot will develop root hairs in hopes to cast a wider moisture grabbing net. It's simply the carrot plant's defense mechanism for drought. Even adequate moisture throughout the life cycle beats the hairy beast. And lastly, your carrots may develop a hairy exterior simply because they're old. Leaving mature carrots in the ground is one of the best ways to store them and keep them fresh. But don't be surprised when past a certain point, they get a little hairy. While not aesthetically the best looking, don't stress because hairy carrots are still perfectly edible. And while you're eating those delicious hairy carrots, make sure to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Brassicas, the kings of cold weather that lets temperate gardeners be productive nearly year round. And kale is on the top of that list. A cold climate miracle plant allowing us to grow and harvest amazing nutritious greens while all other crops have simply called it quits. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we'll never call it quits. And today's episode is all about that kale. More specifically, when is the best time to plant it? Speaking of time, it's short as you know it is, so let's dive in. While of course kale is synonymous with cold weather, it's actually pretty versatile. 
and the many varieties can flourish across many different climates. Hot, dry, extreme weather is to be avoided if you want the best harvest, however, so timing our kale planting is going to be key to maximizing this crop. In general, kale has roughly a three-month life cycle. That is, from seed to a full harvest takes about 90 days. As many of you know though, the plants will keep going and going after partial harvest, so keep that in mind. It's not unusual for large varieties of kale, grown in the right conditions, to last upwards of a year. Amazing stuff. Like we said though, the best harvests happen when the weather is cool. More sugars are sent to the leaves, making them sweeter and tastier the colder it gets. But, like all plants, for the best results, kale needs to get established before the real inclement weather hits, hot or cold. As such, there are two key times to plant your kale during the year for optimal harvesting. For that first spring harvest, plant your conditioned, hardened off kale starts about a month before your last spring frost date, provided the ground is not frozen solid. Basically, as soon as the ground is workable leading into spring, the kale goes in. Now, for that epic autumn harvest, I find it's best to plant your kale two months before the first frost in the fall. After that extreme hot weather of the summer, but well before the bitter cold of winter. One side note, it is best to grow these guys from starter plants. Work backwards an extra four to five weeks if you plan to grow these guys from seed instead to allow for the extra time. Kale is a beauty, and really, you shouldn't miss it. Just like you shouldn't miss the next episode of the Garden Quickie. No doubt about it, everyone loves fresh carrots. Especially the tender baby ones that taste like literal candy. But in the modern food system, not all is what it appears to be. And the product that you're buying in the store might just be the exact opposite of what you think it is. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're exactly who we say we are. And today's episode is all about those baby carrots. More specifically, why the ones at the store aren't really what they seem. Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Anyone that's grown their own vegetables, even if it's just a few successful crops, knows that fresh produce right out of the garden is always superior. And for a select few crops that us backyard gardeners grow, the younger ones just hit differently. I'm talking fingerling potatoes, young pea pods, and especially baby carrots. These guys take the sweetness a step further. Looking to replicate that taste when your own stock is fully harvested, or maybe it's out of season, leaves us with little recourse. Shopping for baby carrots at the local grocery store may give you a bit of a surprise, and not a pleasant one. You see, retail produce sections are obsessed with beauty, at all costs. And carrots sold as babies are in fact full-size carrots that didn't make the grade. Sadly, rejected due to being crooked, deformed, the wrong shape, or even the wrong size. These specimens, deemed unacceptable, are often old and overgrown. They're then cut into identical sections, peeled, shaved, and then polished to make them round and appealing. To make it even worse, because the skin has been removed, you know, the place where most of the nutrients reside, the carrots have to be treated with a chlorinated bath to prevent microbial growth. If you ever wondered why store-bought baby carrots taste a little different and not actually like a real carrot, now you know why. So instead, grow your own. And while you wait for them to grow, make sure to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. It's been a long year, 
And the great thing about the end of the growing season is all of our harvests, like these container beets here. Some crops are picked at peak ripeness and are used pretty quickly, while others are harvested and essentially eaten instantly. And then there's a select few that we store. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, there's nothing we love more than harvest time. And today's episode is all about those harvested beets. More specifically, how do we prep them for maximum storage? Time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Beets, also known as beetroot, are part of the beet plant's root system. They're the unique swollen top section of the main tap root. The entire plant is edible, but for today, we're just gonna focus on storing your freshly harvested beetroots. It's super easy, let me show you how. The first thing we're gonna wanna do is to cut off those stems. Remember though, we can still eat those guys raw or cooked. Simply cut them down to within about an inch or two of the beet itself. And while we're at it, we might as well take off that main tap root right up to the beet bulb. Lastly, manually remove any dirt or debris with a dry cloth or even a paper towel. This part is super important. Do not wash your beets at any time unless you're about to eat them. Place your trimmed, cleaned up beet bulbs in your crisper and they should last up to three months. Beets go soft and spongy, not because they're breaking down or going bad. They go limp because of a lack of moisture. While you should never wash your beets for storage, the cool high humidity of the crisper is going to allow those beets to stay plump and firm for months. Now, for even longer storage, you can safely freeze your beets as well. For this though, an extra step is necessary, and that's boiling them. Boil your completely cleaned up beet bulbs for around 20 to 30 minutes. Cool them down in an ice bath and then peel the outer skin. Use a Ziploc or Tupperware and you can freeze these guys for up to a year. And with that, we've basically mastered beet storage. Which means all that's left to do is check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. For an organic gardener, healthy soil is the most important resource we have. Even if we rarely get to actually see it. As conscientious dirt farmers, protecting our topsoil layers with copious amounts of mulch is priority number one. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show we're in two minutes or less. Like this mulch here, we've got you covered. And today's episode is all about that mulch. More specifically, three materials that you can harvest around your yard for free. Why spend money when quite likely you don't have to? Hey, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Mulching is pretty much non-negotiable for us growers due to the laundry list of benefits that it provides to our garden. And one of the absolute best free sources of mulch are leaves. Even just a single deciduous tree in your yard dropping its fall leaves could provide enough mulch for dozens of raised beds, if not more. Chopped up or left intact, no doubt about it, leaves are the king of mulch. And the beauty of leaves is, they seem to become plentiful right when we need them the most. While the end of life leaves make a great brown mulch, going green can have its benefits as well. That's right, we're talking grass clippings. Fresh cut green grass can shed valuable nutrients back into your soil at the end of a growing season. Now, you can use it fresh or dried, just make sure not to clump it on too thick. And as always, avoid any grass that's been sprayed with pesticides or chemicals. And lastly, in the spirit of using everything we got and coming full circle with our plants, is using the spent crops themselves as an awesome free mulch. Let me explain. Chop and drop all your spent plants right in the place they grew 
for the ultimate in efficiency. Minimal work, no wastage, and returning the exact nutrient profile back into the soil that the plants took out. Easy peasy. What could be better? Nothing except maybe watching the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching, guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, make sure to subscribe and click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.